Welcome back to Halloween in July, bones and ghouls. The spooktacular summer continues with the Night of the Stalker. We're on a quest to find all the spooky Chernobyl Corp games we can, where we delve into the zone looking for radiation and who knows what else, frankly, at this point. Don't forget that to celebrate Halloween in July, we're running a special on the Patreon where yearly rates are slashed as low as they'll go, and anyone who pledges gets their name embroidered onto the big patron apron. Pledge yearly at any amount, and you'll get a sweet iron-on patch to show that you were a true connoisseur of the pain and pledge yearly at the five dollar tier or higher and i'll send you your own patron apron with your name embroidered onto it by yours truly seriously i'm making all of these by myself because screw those clowns that like make shirts for youtubers where the markups are so high you have to charge like 35 dollars just to see any money from a shirt like that's stupid i'd rather just learn how to like keep transfer and embroider myself which is exactly what i did today we're going to be taking a dive into chernobylite a game that isn't really stock Esque, but so many people lump it in with Stalker that it bears a bit of a resemblance and there are a few similarities and settings and ideas. I was also asked quite a bit when I was streaming it if it was any good and we're gonna get to that in a sec because the answer is really subjective. For now though, the best short answer I can give you is if you go in expecting Stalker, you'll have a bad time. But if you go in with an open mind, you might just enjoy yourself quite a bit. Chernobylite is a game set in the not so fantastical but still pretty out there version of the zone where you play as Igor, a former scientist at the Chernobyl MPP who's trying to return there after 30 years to look for his lost lover, Tatiana. Along the way, you'll be able to do things that you were never able to do before in the zone, such as build a base and manufacture your own weapons, teleport for ease of travel, get scolded by a woman for your lack of cleanliness and alter the space-time continuum. Something that's pretty interesting, or actually, no, scratch that. Something that is absolutely nuts about Chernobylite's production is that in order to make it the most accurate representation of the Chernobyl exclusion zone that anyone has ever seen, they went out into Prepyat and scanned the entire place, like short of like the interior of the NPP, of course, I think. According to the Farm 51, who are Chernobylite's developers, they spent five years developing a new scanning technology and then straight up went into Prepyat yet took a crap load of pictures and scans which they turned into the game world. They've got a bunch of videos on Chernobylite's YouTube channel of them doing all this stuff and the scans alone are just extremely impressive. These are most likely the best documentations of the Chernobyl exclusion zone that have ever been made and possibly ever will be made. Places like the Pripyat Cafe which is featured quite a bit in this game have been destroyed or very heavily damaged to the point of like beyond recognition. Really I can't think of a more timely documentation of anything so much as the Farm 51 in Pripyat. Like, even if you decide that Chernobylite is not for you at the end of this video because of the gameplay, it is 100% worth it to check out the videos of them documenting Pripyat. It's fascinating stuff. The game starts with you reliving some flashbacks of you and your lover on the train, and then things go bad because, well, of course they do. What would the game be if there was no initial conflict or turmoil? Turmo no initial conflict or turmoil. You know what? That, that was a good one. I'm leaving that in. Then things get a little weird before you make 90% of Rick's portal gun from Rick and Morty before getting ready to raid the NPP. Igor and his assembled team are getting ready to go into the Chernobyl NPP, and it doesn't go so well. You get to where you need to be be, but something isn't right. You're having more weird flashbacks or possibly hallucinations. Not only do you almost immediately get found out once you do what you came to do, but you also get to meet the game's recurring antagonist, the Black Stalker. He wrecks all of your team but one guy before you get lucky, find a special crystal called Chernobylite that allows you to alter reality, and you finish your portal gun so you can get the hell out of there. Yeah, that could have gone a lot better. So, you wake up in the middle of the woods like you do when you fail a heist, and you're gonna have to find your way through to the meeting place you set up beforehand in case the heist went bad. Good thing you did that, by the way. Here you're introduced to one of the basic mechanics of foraging. You know, that scanner thing you got that was helping you keep track of radiation at the MPP? It also has a feature that lets you ping the surrounding area to look for vital resources. What's even better is that you don't even have to specify what you're looking for. It'll just straight up highlight anything useful within a short distance from you so you can collect all the stuff and do some crafting. Once you get through the woods, you'll meet up with the only surviving member of your team, Oliver. You guys are renting out this warehouse from a guy named Mikhail, who we'll see more of later, but for now, it's 
literally just a busted up old warehouse filled with trash and an uncomfortable distance away from the NPP. This is where you're going to set up your scout missions, assign your dudes once you get them, and where you'll also be able to craft pretty much whatever you need. And if you're smart, you'll be able to produce all the food and organic material you could ever possibly need, and you're never gonna have to worry about resources about two thirds of the way through this game. That's not gonna be for a while though, so get to scavenging. In the meantime, you're actually going to have to clean this place out and start building basic necessities. First order of business is to clear out all the junk that'll net you a small amount of resources, but once you've got that out of the way, you're going to need to get the essentials going. Beds for Oliver and future members, basic crafting stations so you can make essentials, power for your base, and some air purification stuff since you're not exactly out in the most pristine of forests. Other stuff will come later, but for now you should really focus on foods, beds, and basic crafting. Once you've got the basics down, I suggest you start making as many herb and food growing planters as possible between adding more crafting related stuff because food is a big issue in this game. And if you don't have to worry about searching for it, you're going to have a lot more time to actually get things done out in the zone. So once you have your base in a sort of working order, it's time to venture out into the zone and do, well, stuff. It's uh, kind of ambiguous. There are objectives you'll need to complete in order to advance the plot, but for now, it's gonna be a lot of exploring and more importantly, resource collecting. In the early game, you're going to have exactly zero food production and things are gonna get bad if people start going hungry within the first few days of your expedition. Lucky for you, whenever an area doesn't have a story related mission in it, you'll have a minor mission available such as hunt a monster, scavenge for medical supplies, find an ammo catch, and most importantly for us right now, intercept a NAR supply drop. Most of these are essentially the exact same mission in similar areas, save for what you're going to go get at the end. You go to a specific point on the map, sneak past or perform advanced vibe checks on NAR soldiers bumming around the mission objective and get your stuff. Careful with those vibe checks early on though, as in the early game, the NAR goons severely outgun you and now is not a good time to be getting shipped off to their prison. You'll be spending a lot of time in the early game wandering around these maps, not only to learn them, but also to do the objectives. And while you're looking around, there's gonna be a lot of random encounters to fill out the world. Encounters can be boiled down to three categories. People want to sell you things, moral quandaries, or spooky stuff. People that want to sell you things just sort of show up and they have one kind of thing they want to trade for. There's Mr. Hustler Grind set that won't ever shut up about watching Warren Buffett YouTube videos who will sell you like general goods. The old guy who I, I actually never really bothered to buy anything from him so I don't remember what he has. And Mr. Squats over here that will sell you literal goddamn loot boxes. At least Mr. Squats is pretty easy to find thanks to his boom box. Moral quandaries are pretty simple. You find a gnar dude in a bad spot, you choose whether or not to help him, and then if you help him, you might get helped later on down the road if you get shipped off to the prison complex. Finally, and also finally some spooky stuff in Halloween in July, we've got the spookies. You'll know the spookies are coming when you see a bunch of old dollies laying around. On top of getting a good scare, these also help you figure out what the heck happened in Pripyat surrounding your research since they're often accompanied by discovering photos or straight up hallucinations of Tatiana. You'll get a hallucination or something that'll jump out at you, but you'll learn more about what happened. So it's a nice trade off and it advances the plot. Oh, and there's one thing I almost forgot about. Violence. Combat in Chernobylite is pretty traditional from the outset. You can sneak around to get a better angle or just charge the baddies down. You can build for stealth or for overt violence or both with your skill points, but it's fun to be an overpowering force of violence that sounds off with a force of a thunderstorm announcing that an NAR patrol no longer exists. By the way, I never figured out if it's NAR or NAR, so I might use these interchangeably, but you know who I'm talking about, the bad guys. There's five different types of weapons in Chernobylite, ranging from a pistol, an assault rifle, a shotgun, the laser thing, and finally a crossbow, all of which are very customizable. What I really like about the customization is not only just how much you can do with each gun and how specialized they can be, but also how much they change visually with each mod. Like, I love that kind of like Bioshock type deal. We had a lot of laughs on the stream when someone would join chat and be like, like, is that a belt fed pistol? Because yes, yes it was. So since this game is taking place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, of course there is going to be radiation damage on top of the traditional trauma damage, which again, of course, is magically fixed by taking some sort of serum or homebrew thing that just makes the radiation go away. Where it gets a little more interesting though, is Igor takes psychological damage from excessive violence. Mow down a bunch of dudes or kill someone in a particularly gruesome way, that's gonna make you take sanity damage. Having a mental breakdown is about the same as dying in game, so you're gonna wanna keep it in check. How do you do that? Well, on the lower level, there's calming salts, and you can also just 
pound clear liquor to reduce large amounts of mental trauma, which I do not suggest doing in IRL. Also, there are a few skills you can learn that reduce the amount of trauma you accrue when you kill someone, but I personally believe there are better things to spend your skill points on. Now that you've got yourself established after the botch raid on the NPP, it's time to start rebuilding your crew. Oliver is still here from the last crew, even with a busted up arm, and he'll be the one to help you take baby steps back into planning how you get into the innermost chambers of the NPP and stop whatever Gnar is doing in there. On top of helping you get through the basics and some training later on, Oliver and the other recruits have an important purpose. They go on missions too, so that you can focus on the story missions without having to worry about dwindling resources. It's never a guarantee that they'll be successful though, but the same could be said about you when you take on a mission. You can send a team member to do a story mission on your behalf, but they won't actually be able to accomplish the task. If they're successful, it'll just significantly decrease enemy population in the area the next day so that you can go on the story mission without having to worry about too many variables popping up. So in between missions while you're at the base, your radio is going to start sounding off a lot because despite you keeping a low profile in order to make sure the NAR don't find your base, it seems that literally everyone else in the zone has your frequency because you're on some sort of Star Labs security system here. While you're chasing down leads to find out what happened with Tatiana and the Meltdown, everyone is gonna want you to run an errand or three for them. You'll meet Mikhail, your landlord who is knucking futz, but who will eventually join your team, Tarakan, the old man who is also crazy, and Sashko, Tarakan's assistant, who is crazy in his own way. Are you picking up a pattern here? Finally, you've got Olga, who lives in the walled settlement in the Red Forest, which is kind of its own extra special kind of crazy, but at least she has some common sense about her. Usually, each person will want you to do a thing, or again, like three or four things for them, that fits their own personal motives, and once you do those, you can whoop out the Rick and Morty portal gun to spirit them away to your base. It's worth noting that you can lose people if things get too dire in your base, or even if you make poor choices before finishing a potential recruit's quest line, you won't even have the option to recruit them because they don't want to hang out with you. Uh, also, you can lose, like, relationship status with them, like you can have like them hate you, but I never got it to the point even after repeated decisions that a character does not like or someone got so disgusted with me that they left. Heck, recruits can even get straight up kidnapped while out on a mission by the NIR. Most of these choices are pretty straightforward though, and it's really not that hard to see what exactly is going to make a person not want to team up with you, so you can avoid it pretty easily. But... In the event that you screw up and someone doesn't want to join your team or say, maybe you accidentally murdered somebody's husband when you really just thought you were going to search their body, uh, you can just straight up alter the timeline. That Chernobylite you're seeing everywhere, it has properties that let it alter space-time. Every time you die, you're sent to the green dimension at the cost of one of your Chernobylite crystals, which also, they literally grow on trees, so it's like, it's not exactly a very costly transaction, and you get presented with all your choices in this like literally it's a long choice corridor and for the cost of three chernobylite crystals a piece you can alter like history you can change whatever you need to change so that you can get people to join your party or just get them back in general if they got kidnapped say again you accidentally unwittingly killed olga's husband and now she won't join you it's cool just the next time you die walk over to that point in space time and use your chernobylite to change it where you just told them to get lost and what do you know olga's in your party now missed out on a cool upgrade because of a space choice well well, uh, don't worry, you can alter that too. You can even avoid having to die in a mission and potentially losing your stuff in the later game by building a disintegration chamber that lets you uh, self-annihilate in the comfort of your base and change the timeline from the comfort and security of your home. Surely this will have no long-term ramifications. Among your new squaddies, your first acquisition is most likely going to be Mikhail, then either Terrakan or Sashko interchangeably, with Olga most likely being your last acquisition later on since her quest seemed to trigger much later in the game. Each squad mate will have a bunch of unique dialogue once you get them in your base and also have certain strengths and weaknesses when it comes to assigning them on missions. It's not the fanciest stuff. Some people are better at intercepting ammo, others are better at scavenging for food. The real benefit about having a full squad isn't just for the end game, but more for how once you have a full squad, you don't have to pick and choose what to leave on the table when it's time to go out on a mission, meaning that effectively, so long as you assign everyone right, which is not not hard to do it 
all, all your resources are going to start steadily going up. People can get hurt on missions or just be not very well suited to anything. So there's also the option to bench someone and also giving them extra food will make them heal faster. But most importantly at all, what you really, really want to do with your squad is have them at the ready so that you can access their training options. You level up in Chernobylite through uncovering leads on Tatiana, completing tasks, and indiscriminate violence. When you level up, you get a skill point and you can't do much with that on your own unless you have your buddies in your base who are willing to teach you. You don't just learn new things either. You actually get a nice little mini game segment where you go out into the forest with them and they actually teach you how to do the thing, which I think is a really nice touch, be it the better stealth, better inventory management, even if it's something that's like not a major like thing you can do, like just having Olga lay out all your stuff and show you how to properly pack your bag. That's great. I love that. That is really immersive. And once you get the stuff that lets you like pick up more resources from each node and build things more efficiently, that's when things really start to take off. Once you have those abilities centered around getting more resources per node, carrying more stuff, and being able to build anything in your base with less materials, it's time to actually start building your base. Everybody gets the nice bed. Build every last crafting station, even if you have no intention of building certain weapons and armors. Have more power generation, comfort, and air quality than you could possibly need. And most importantly, it's farming time. It is time to fill a quarter of the usable space in your base with herbs, mushrooms, and finally, produce. The vegetable gardens are an obvious enough benefit, you don't have to worry about food anymore, but in order to get enough of those vegetable gardens going, you're going to also need a lot of herbs and mushrooms, and it's just far more efficient to build little planters for those too, because they are also key components in like half the stuff you need to craft. Once food is solved, everything gets solved. After the farm goes up, it's a matter of days before you need to start making new containers just for all your extra materials alone. You'll have so much stuff that not only have you equipped yourself with all the best gear possible in the game, but all of your squad mates too, just because you're sick of them not having over a 90% success rate on their missions. And now you should probably also remember that you have a story to complete. Hey everyone, welcome to the cooking segment. This is actually the third cooking segment I've done for this particular video, and the final one I filmed for Halloween in July, as my psyche goes screaming to the finish line like a stock car that's had all four tires blown out and is on fire in multiple places. I can't wait for you to all see the mental breakdown during the pizza segment next week. The first cooking segment of this video was me making some sweet marinara sauce, but then I learned a whole lot more about canning and preserving foods like sauces, and I realized it'd be best if I scrapped that and left such things to professionals who knew what they were doing. Then I did an eggplant parmesan and everything was good until I noticed that my own recipe was a little too similar to another food blogger's recipe and I wasn't comfortable with posting it as my own. So it's gone. I finally settled on just filming myself doing my weekly meal prep as it's something I do, well, uh, weekly. And meal preps are a great way to save money by having nice lunches and snacks ready to go so you aren't tempted to hit the drive through delivery services, or buy a bunch of those crappy microwave meals at the store. Now, before we get into this, the last thing I'll say is that while while meal preps can be healthy and a tool to help lose weight, mine are most likely not because as you can see, I am fat. So all of this is gonna be based around one of these. A 10 pound bag of chicken quarters. They're about eight bucks now, which makes me yearn for the days like a few months ago when you could get them for five. These are available at just about every grocery store or a Walmart if you absolutely need to go to a Walmart. Based on the yield, these are by far the most cost-effective choice as large packs of chicken legs can cost eight to 12 bucks and packs of thighs are usually only a bit cheaper. With this bag of quarters, we're paying less than half of what it would cost to use like pre-portioned chicken in meat costs alone. We've got about eight quarters here, which means that's easily enough to get four full-size meals plus eight smaller portions that can go for either a light lunch or a heavy snack, depending on how you're feeling. I cut holes into the bottom of this big old bag and let the excess filler fluid drain into the sink and then place the quarters on a full-sized paper towel lined baking sheet to drain out a bit while we get ready to break them down because these things are gonna be easier to handle if they're not all wet. We're gonna start by doing nothing too wild. Just separate the leg from the thigh. I find that the joint you're looking for is always a little bit closer to 
the leg than you think it's gonna be. And if you're stumped, you can always just split the quarters with your hands to expose the joint, or just cut right through the bone if you got a sturdy knife. Always make sure your knife is being held firmly with your index finger and thumb on the knife hand to keep it in place that way. You don't want the knife deflecting into your skin and having your finger and thumb on the knife blade helps that a lot. If you're iffy about doing this, you can always just have the whole thing intact and throw it in the oven and then cut the bones once it's out of the oven and the bones are more brittle or just straight up serve it as a single piece, but you might have a hard time fitting the whole quarters into your containers because they're large. Once the legs are free from the thighs, salt them and place them on a smaller paper towel lined half sheet to store in the fridge and let them like get all that filler crap out because they put a ton of that in chicken these days and it's all gonna drain out through the salt. In the meantime, we gotta get a little fancy here and debone our thighs. I'll be the first to admit that I'm not the best at this since I only started doing it recently and that it is again a process you can entirely skip if you wanna. Uh, what you kind of do here is use a boning knife to get under that sort of like, I guess, pallet bone, whatever that is, and then cut around the other bone that runs through the thigh. And as you can see here, I'm doing a very poor job. I would really suggest looking this up and seeing like what more skilled people do or just skipping it entirely. Lucky for me though, I'm uh, not gonna lose out on any of this meat I'm leaving behind on the bones as nothing is going to waste here. I'm gonna try my hand at making a broth today or perhaps the stock or a base. I really don't know as there's both bone and meat going into this pot. Get all your thighs nice and deboned, making sure to check each thigh for stray bits of bones before salting them and putting them in the fridge underneath the legs to drain and also flatten them out for easier cooking. Now let's try starting that broth. So I'm putting about five quarts or so of filtered water into my new big pot and tossing all the bone bits in there. While that's coming up to temp, I'm gonna wash and chop up a whole stock of celery, a bag of carrots, and three medium-sized yellow onions. We can add some spices and stuff later, but not before we skim. Get it all in the pot and wait for it to come to a boil. Maybe turn your oven on while this is happening so it's ready to go. And while that's all happening, now would be a good idea to get all your other pots and pans you'll need on standby, specifically a medium-sized pot for rice and a large pot with a pasta strainer on top of it and a lid on top of that for the veggies. You'll also wanna have like a large saucepan nearby too, but I'm opting not to have that on my cooktop yet as real estate is a little tight right now and I don't want anything hanging off the edge or not fully on its burner. Once you've got the big pot boiling for a few minutes, the fat and the other stuff is gonna rise up to the top. Bring it down to a simmer and start skimming off all that crud. After trying a few different ways, in hindsight, I think the best way to go about this is to start with like your mesh strainer to get all like the little chunks and bits out and then use a ladle to get as much fat per dipping out as possible without like taking too much of the good stuff with it. Like kind of like pushing it in there and letting like the fat on the top just like slide over the rim. Because you can see here, I lost a good bit of broth just using like this little like serving spoon. Uh, I even had to refill my broth with more water a few times. Once you've got the bulk of all that fat off the top of your broth though, go ahead and add any seasonings you want and a healthy bit of salt, cover this sucker and then just let it simmer for like three hours or so. Like I've seen recipes that say do it for half an hour. I've seen recipes that say do it for six hours. Somewhere between three and six hours seems to be the sweet spot. Now that we don't need to do anything for the broth for at least another three hours, we can work on the meal preps. El Horno should be preheated to 350 freedom units or about 175 euro units. And then once it's good and hot, make sure you swap out those paper towels for some parchment paper on your trays, then put both your legs and your thighs into El Horno for 45 minutes. For now, all the seasoning I'm really gonna be doing here is sprinkling a layer of that good old fashioned taco seasoning on the legs and then letting the thighs just go in with nothing but the skin on them for flavor. We'll season those up later. While the chicken's cooking, let's get everything else ready. Fill your medium sized pot with four cups of water for the rice and fill your large pot with a strainer over it with like a couple inches of water. We're not gonna cook anything in that water. We just need to have enough of it so it keeps boiling for long enough to steam the veggies. Put your veggies into the strainer and then cover it with that lid. And then once the medium sized pot is boiling, add some salt and two cups of uncooked rice to it, reduce to a low heat, cover and cook for 20 minutes. This will all yield about six cups of rice, which equates to half a cup of rice per serving. And so long as you've got the boil going strong on them veggies, the veggies should be done by the time you're done portioning out the rice. Speaking of which, portion out the rice by putting a half cup each into each container with the snack size ones having their bottoms covered with the rice. And then for the meal size portions, I kind of have the rice off to the side, leaving a space for the veggies. Then when the veggies are ready, put a whole cup into the meal size portions in the space that the rice isn't taking up. And then half a cup of veggies on top of the rice in the snack size portion, like kind of make it a layer. These are now 
basically ready to go once the chicken's ready. Once the timer goes off, pull the chicken out and temp it to make sure that at the thickest part of the largest drumstick, it measures to at least 165 freedom heat units and then you are good to go. That is, once we let these birds rest. Now will be a good time for us to make the sauce for our snacks. I don't actually keep a consistent sauce recipe since I'm always iterating on it and I like to mix things up week to week. For this batch though, we're doing one part soy sauce to two parts chicken broth and yeah, I'm using some of this pre box stuff as our homemade batch isn't ready yet. I'm mixing it in with a few loosely packed heaping tablespoons of brown sugar, a heaping tablespoon of chili powder, and while I normally use a healthy squirt of sriracha in this, uh, this bottle's a little sus, so uh, we're gonna go with some red pepper flakes. You can also try adding in more stuff like garlic, Sichuan peppers, or other peppers, or whatever you're into at the moment. Sauce can be whatever you want it to be. Once everything's in the bowl, I'm gonna whisk it together real good while slowly adding in a couple tablespoons of flour to act as a binding and thickening agent, and then it's gonna go into that saucepan we set aside. We're gonna let this uh, cook in the pan for like maybe five minutes or so just to let it reduce for a bit while we keep stirring it. You'll notice that it's got some really thick, slow bubbles coming out of it, which means uh, a something, I, I really don't know, sorry. And after you see that the sauce has reduced like a good bit, transfer it to a heat safe container or better yet, turn the heat off for a few minutes, then transfer it to a heat safe container and then set it aside to add for the snacks. Now for the easiest part, the portioning of the chicken. For all the meals here, all you have to do is uh, just put a couple of those drumsticks like two a piece on top of the rice and veggies and you're done. As for the thighs, since we cooked them on a low and slow setting to allow us to multitask and not smoke up our home, because in case you didn't know, chicken fat has a relatively low smoke point. Uh, unfortunately, this low temperature, while it does leave the chicken juicy, the skin gets a little too tough to enjoy. I left the skin on here so that we can get the flavor of the skin in the chicken thighs, but now we're gonna use our tongs to carefully peel off the skin so that we don't burn ourselves, cut each thigh into little strips, and then put a thigh's worth of strips into each snack size container. If you've got a thigh that's like overly small or really big, don't be afraid to add a little bit of one thigh into another thigh's container. Almost done now. We just need to add a couple tablespoons of our homemade sauce that's nice and thickened to each of the snack containers. Save the rest for some other meals that could do with having some sauce added to it and give everything a few more minutes to cool down before covering all the containers with their respective lids before popping them into the fridge. Congratulations, you just took eight bucks of chicken plus another buck or so for two cups of rice and then some mixed veggies and you made yourself four really good sized dinners and eight snacks on top of that. So you've got a crew, you've got a veritable factory inside of your base, and you've got yourself outfitted with everything you could possibly need to take on those gnar baddies. Great, small problem though. Those uh, six maps that you're playing are starting to get really old, especially since you're gonna end up doing a lot of the same stuff in the same spots for different missions. Even once the spooky things, such as these dudes I call the Slippery Boys for their habit of slipping away from me before I can completely vibe check them, that once they start appearing in areas and the little bug things too, uh, it's just not that, engaging, even though the Chernobylite is starting to get out of control. Like while the overall layout of the map is the same, some things change because there, now there are giant crystals growing out of everything. It doesn't really help that you're just going to be in the same place over and over again, even with that, with the occasional new group of dudes in a certain area though. We come back to that whole, oh, it's a bummer that the treadmill is setting in so quick. And at times it just feels like you're doing missions that are there to waste the day. Just put another day between you and running the next simulation to pad out the game, but I guess that's how it is. While we're waiting for the opportunity to finally start the end game, let's talk about the baddies, the NAR or the NAR. I'm still not sure how you call them. The NAR is a private firm that paid the Ukrainian government a whole lot of money for access to the zone. And some of the key people that worked with Igor on his project are now working for the NAR. Among them, the Black Stalker. It's a mystery as to who exactly this guy is. And even when you think you figured it out, it turns out there's a lot more to him. The NAR guys are just run of your mill enemies, but the Black Stalker is a more novel encounter meant to throw you for a loop in the event that you're getting too comfortable with the zone. Uh, that is, if he started appearing way earlier in the game before you had all your good gear. The Black Stalker will appear when the Chernobylite storms start to reach their peak. And if you really want to, you can construct diffusers that will like stop the storm from brewing, thus negating the appearance of the Black Stalker. But he's just so easy to clown on that by the time he starts 
parts actually showing up, there's no point in wasting resources on that because bullets are cheaper than complicated machinery. This dude can Rick and Morty himself in just about anywhere in the map, and he can even stop you from doing the same in some circumstances. But even with his high HP pool, he's just not that much of a threat. Maybe if they treated him or buffed him, made him more like the Nightmare in Prey 2017, it'd be a little more engaging, like force you to hide from him unless you were like obscenely built up. But as he is, he's just not much of a threat. So between turning entire squads of NAR soldiers into a fine mist with your rapid fire cassette loading shotgun and making the Black Stalker go away with your 60 round fly swatter, you'll be looking for clues as to what the heck really happened with all your research. This is done not only through completing the main quest as certain members that you will recruit seem to have insider knowledge about it, but also by looking at those hallucinations and finding documents and clues. Once you collect enough evidence, you'll be able to use the Chernobylite enhanced headset in your living quarters to make a space-time reconstruction of the past. This is where you're going to learn all the crazy stuff about the NAR, Tatiana, and even the Black Stalker before getting ready to raid the NPP once again. So you've got all the dudes, you've run all the simulations, it's time to raid the NPP again. You'll start with a big group dialogue where you choose who is going to do what and there are correct answers to all of these questions. Luckily for you, the context you get from what everyone says makes it very easy to know who should be assigned to what job. Once you've done the final memory, you can start this at just about any point you want to, but it's best not to do so until you've got all five crew members at your side and you've also built up their gear. This is easy enough to do when you're resource rich and you can literally just alter time until everyone is on your team. In fact, you don't even need to do things explicitly related to recruiting members if one went missing. Olga once went on a mission and never came back, but rather than having to intentionally get myself killed or surrender to the NAR so I could go to the base and look for her, I just went to alter a certain moment in time where she could have been there, and so she was. And when I wrapped it up, Olga was back just like that. The raid can go pretty smoothly or fun. If you look this up beforehand or just use common sense, the raid will be very, very quiet. I didn't even see any actual combat until I was almost at the very end of the big heist. And I'll admit I kind of botched what I did on purpose because I was bored. You know how when you're grinding in Payday 2 and you're just doing stealth on lower level missions like the Branch Bank? Playing the NPP raid as smoothly as it can go is kind of like the downtime you get when you successfully do stealth really fast and now you just have to sit around for like five minutes waiting for the thermal drill to do its thing. Yeah, that's basically the NPP raid, except instead of having to restart the drill, you just keep on walking through the NPP and uh, you get prompted to like choose what to do next. If it wasn't for the fact that going loud almost guarantees that most of your party will die and you get the bad ending, which I kind of got anyway, I'd almost always suggest intentionally botching it just so that something cool will happen. All right, it's time to get to the center of the NPP and confront the final boss. We're about to get into spoilers, so I would suggest going to the timestamp if you don't want them. Okay? Okay. So the final boss is the Black Stalker, except he's using his portal gun to clone himself reverse flash style, which makes it slightly harder, but not so hard that I wasn't able to do it on my first try. Then things get weird. So we previously learned the identity of the Black Stalker was some guy that fancied Tatiana, but he got upset when she wanted to be with us instead of him, so he uses his position at the KGB to get her disappeared. Shortly thereafter, everything went sideways like it did, and here we are. It turns out that while it's the body of the guy who snitched, being the Black Stalker, it's actually the psyche and consciousness of us. Igor, and we are not who we think we are. Earlier on in the game, one of the clues you can find is a document stating that Tatiana had a child who ran away when he was 10 and was presumed dead because, well, it's a runaway child in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Turns out that we are that child and we were altered to mature into an adult extremely fast and also to think that we were Igor so that we would come and save Tatiana. Except the real Igor was here the whole time. It was actually the Black Stalker. Those hallucinations we've been seeing weren't so much hallucinations as they were Tatiana psychically contacting us or something else. I'm not really quite sure at this point, but wait, it gets weirder. Turns out there were consequences to constantly trying to alter the timeline to fit our needs. We weren't actually altering our own timeline. We were creating new, slightly different versions of our own timeline and leaving behind worse realities. We learned this through seeing a bunch of terrible stuff we didn't actually do, at least not in this particular playthrough. And then we see Oliver, who by the way was supposed to be a traitor in our timeline, come through a portal of his own using his gun, like his own portal gun, which he took off us to save us from the Black Stalker. And it gets even weirder because we learned that all Chernobylite is a 
sentient entity, which not only can transcend all space and all time, but all multiple timelines. It is omnipresent in the multiverse. And we were able to contact it through the Chernobyl incident. And it is, or perhaps it is just taking on the persona of Tatiana. We don't know if Tatiana became the Chernobylite or if the Chernobylite became her. It's ambiguous because also her dead body was earlier on in the NPP. Or was she alive? This stuff is getting really weird. However, this all seems to be a projection of her consciousness and we've established that Tatiana can do that before. So we are given the choice to either commune with the Chernobylite or outright destroy it, which uh, doesn't exactly lend much weight to the claim that it's a god. Once we make our choice, we're treated to that slideshow style ending as we try to figure out what the hell just happened in the last 20 minutes of the game. So my final thoughts on Chernobylite are that while it does suffer from some pacing issues in the later game and could really do with some sort of balance pass to keep things more interesting, it's still a visually stunning game and the skin work the Farm 51 did on the actual Pripyat is amazing. It's worth noting that as I record this, the Farm 51 is teasing some sort of new DLC or something on their YouTube channel, but by the time you're watching this, we'll most likely know what that is. If I had one major suggestion for you if you wanted to play this, it'd again be to not go in expecting anything like Stalker, Fallout, or Metro. Chernobylite is entirely its own thing that kind of has similarities to the three of those games, but does everything in its own way. I'm not sure if it does anything that makes it stand out from those three gameplay-wise, but that scanned aesthetic is still pretty much enough for price of entry just to look at the game. It looks amazing. Thank you all so much for joining me. Tune in next week for the finale of Halloween in July, where we head back into the Metro for another adventure with Artia. Don't forget that we're running that special over on patreon.com slash and wonder where any pledge gets you on the patron apron and yearly pledges all get the iron on patch or even their own patron apron embroidered by yours truly as an added thank you for supporting the channel in the meantime please stay safe stay indoors wear sunscreen when you gotta go out wash your hands regularly and enjoy this cat video this saucy boy he was all peeved off earlier on the table just swapped over his um, scratchy post to the fresh side and sprinkled the catnip on it and he's just a blissful boy. Look at that dreaming little kitty dreams. I don't even want to move over and try to get the pet. He's just having such a nice time. Boy. Oh no, he's up. All right, it's cool. False alarm, I think. Yeah, we're good. <laughs>